there's a war taking place on Britain's streets. Stop resisting! On one side are embattled police officers defending the thin blue line. We're out there 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. On the other are thugs with no respect for the law. I've been knocked unconscious, I've been hospitalised, I've had knives pulled on me. Put it down! In the UK, a police officer is attacked every 20 minutes. They don't care who you are, what you are, how big you are. Get down! Violence has reached unprecedented levels. It's almost a hobby to attack police officers. But our coppers have a unique tool to help them keep safe. An emergency button pressed only when they are in extreme danger. Give me back up now! Give me back up now! Be out of all units, all units. Call sign code zero. When the button gets pressed, your life stops. It sends a signal to every copper in the area and says urgent assistance required. If a police officer's pressing that button, it generally means the shit's at the front. Now, for the first time, Cops on the front line reveal what it's really like when they come under attack. People will say it's your job, that's what you signed up to do. But it doesn't say you were like you should be assaulted. Sharing, in their own words and with their own footage, life and death situations. I felt myself being lifted and swung like a battering ram. As they issue the distress call nobody wants to hear. Well, I hadn't even prepared not to come out in that day. Police code zero. Today, told for the first time, a suspect runs off before turning to launch a vicious assault. He veered up, slammed my head against the garage. I got punched in the face. An officer's life is in danger as his police car is stolen. Are you going to kill us? Oh, yes. This lad just floored it. And I remember thinking, you know, am I going to make it home tonight? And a plainclothes policeman is knocked unconscious by a fleeing car. It's like something from an action movie. But of course, he didn't get up. In England and Wales, there is a ratio of one police officer for every 480 people. The last eight to 10 years, we've seen a constant shrinking. Uh, so we've seen less police officers now. We've had to do more with, uh, more with less around our budget. When we do have a serious incident, we see a, a, a real movement of, of officers and resources, which has an impact on policing in other areas. In recent decades, the overall um, level of crime has been falling. But last year, numbers were up. I think we have become a less tolerant, more violent society. And I think that's a terrible place for us to be. And I don't know the, the reasons for that. You could say it's a breakdown of the family units. You could say that we're soft on crime. My view is that the sentences should be and must be much harsher. And if there is no consequence to the actions of these individuals, then they will do it again and again. In Wiltshire, Jamie Collins has only been a police officer since 2017. I wanted to join the police because it was something different. It was a job where you wouldn't be sat in an office. I'd never look outside and go, oh, I wish I could go and do something else. There was a lot more pressure than I expected. Jamie is a very kind person. He's very hardworking. He's not going to hold back and avoid doing things because He's Jamie and he's going to still get stuck in. Wiltshire's very rural. You can have 10, 15 miles between towns. There are a number of domestic incidents that we go to. Rural burglaries, people stealing high-value items, thefts of tools, machinery, 
from houses in those faraway places. The shift had been fine. It had been a few uh, minor jobs um, that I'd managed to deal with there and then. I got tasked to this incident in Melksham. Another hub uh, had asked for our hub to send somebody over to help out, so I went over. I was out of my normal area. I was aware that there wasn't really anybody that was going to be with me. We were having a really busy day. We had suspects in custody um, and 999 emergencies coming in very fast. There was a report of a man that had smashed through a window and had then taken his two-year-old son with him but was still in the area. I drove into the street and I could see him with two or three other people um, standing there and he had the two-year-old in his arms. As soon as he saw my car come around the corner, he ran off towards some garages and down an alley. So I got out of my car and ran after him. When we got to the end of the alley, he then stopped, um, child in arms. So we're currently Mill Lane with Are Philip at the moment. <laughs> All right, okay. Let me, let's give little one. Oh, no. Phil. We started talking about whether he'd give over the child, and he said, no, 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 I'm not going to do that. Look, we need to get your hands forward first, don't we? Why not? What's happened today, then? Run me through it. The child looked absolutely terrified. Um, he was crying. Yeah. Yeah. Don't cry. Yeah, in order. I thought, hopefully, he's going to be calm, we can negotiate, we can talk about this. Just asking me where I am, right? Yeah, I'm Mill Lane, and I'm with Philip at the moment, just talking to him. Just get around there and talk to him. No, we'll stay here, yeah. shall we, mate? No. He then began to walk back up the track that he just came down and towards the people that he'd been talking to, and I was in tow. I'm doing it with some of my friends, because they... You just confirm what's been disclosed, then? I could see that he had a very badly injured arm, and I was worried at the fact that he was also bleeding out, because there was a lot of blood coming out of there, and I presume that's from where he'd smashed the window. But quite a heavy injury to his right hand as well, so we're going to need an ambulance, I think. Ambulance. Mate, you need to be checked out for that, don't you? Look. I don't want a fucking ambulance. Right? Uh, Bill, calm no. down. Calm down. Don't tell me I need this. My mind was going through how can I get this child off him. That was, at, at that point, my main concern. Phil, at the moment then, you need to get somebody to give, give, the, give the child over, all right? I'm going to, uh, it's going to happen. Because you smashed the window, haven't you? I haven't smashed the window. Listen to me. Can someone take the little one off then, please? Come on. Take. 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 Phil, can you just give, give him over for me now? No, because you said you were going to listen to me, man. Right well, I'm going to listen to you. No, at the moment, you're walking off, aren't you? Well, listen to me. Ted, can you talk to me in front of my crew? Give him over and we'll have a chat, alright? No. Right, in that case then, it's gonna, we're going to have to take him, aren't we? Thankfully, I think more because his friends told him to give him over, he gave the child over. Right, Phil, I'm going to put these on you, yeah. all right? And at that point, he then backed up a little bit. Put them out front. Yeah. Phil. I then gave chase to him, and he stopped dead, turned around, and flicked his arm up, which covered my face in blood. Fuck off, you Straight away, I could just taste blood in my mouth. I knew exactly what it was, and that really worried me. I've got someone else's blood in my mouth. This is horrible. He's trying to fight me. I need to get him on the ground. Get down, no! Whilst we were on the ground, he kicked me in the chest. I got punched in the face. You said you were going to talk to me. You thought you were going to talk to me. No. I thought, oh. This has now gone south. I need somebody here now. And that was the point where I pressed my emergency button. You said you were going to talk to me. You said you were going to talk to me. As I pressed my emergency button, my radio ripped off my stab vest. 
and went to the floor and I, there was no chance of me getting that back. So I just hoped that I managed to press it and that people knew that this was going on. The next thing you know, the emergency button had been activated and yeah, I just instantly felt fit because I knew it was Jamie. Um, and I couldn't hear what Jamie was saying. So all we could hear was the sound of Jamie being thrown up against garages, being assaulted. We needed to get there fast. You said you were going to talk to me. You said you were going to talk to me. Get no. He veered up, slammed my head against the garage. And then we went back down to the floor and I managed to, to pin him down. You said you were going to talk to me. Right, like stay calm. I then hear Jason come in um, from the back shouting, get down or something like that, show me your hands. Stay calm. Get down now, show me your hands now. Put your... There. Show me your hands he now. Said he was Stop talk moving. To me. He said he was going to talk to me. Stop moving now. No. Fuck you, you prick. Wait. See, look, over the top. Dave, video it. Yeah. His arms were going everywhere and he was actually trying to scrape his wound on the gravel floor. There's some people on the spot, don't Calm yourself down. I'm done, mate. And we'll get you some help, all right? When I arrived at the scene, Jamie's face was just covered in blood and it was horrific. Um, I could see blood all up the garage that Jamie had been thrown into. Um, I could see that the male was still struggling. Time is 20, 26. Watch. Keep your hands still. <laughs> you go from this point where you're trying to get control of this guy, you're trying to essentially beat him in a in a fight that he's he started, to then we've got to look after him now. Um, we've got to make sure that he doesn't do any more damage to this arm, and we need to get him an ambulance. Down, right? Ooh, you know, you know, fucking hand. No, because you laughed out and kicked me and punched me as well. Because you said you were going to speak to me like a man, and you didn't. And you ran off. No, you've done the opposite. Admit the right. truth. Admit the truth. That's what happened. It's all on my body camera. Even when we had him um, detained in handcuffs and leg restraints, he was still continuing to try and graze and scrape his knuckles across the ground, and he just wasn't yeah. stopping. Wait. <laughs> blood all over my face and in my mouth and wanted to try and I was spitting it out as best I could it was something I don't normally like to do spit out in public but to me it was a case of I really don't want to swallow any more of this yeah oh really the suspect's blood had been thrown in Jamie's face we didn't know if the suspect had any infections my priority was to get Jamie to hospital to get him checked I went into A&E they explained to me that it would be a case that they go and ask him to give a sample of his blood that can be tested um, just to make sure that there's n no bloodborne diseases or anything like that. They went and asked the guy who was in the same A&E department as me having his hand treated and he refused to have any blood tests done. So it was then a case that I was told and it will be a five months of testing. I was angry at that point. Having a blood test isn't that much of an issue um, and he outright refused to do it. My partner, she was devastated. She broke down in tears. went to court the next day. So for him, it was over and done with. It was five months after the incident I got the all clear. I was so relieved when I got the results because it's just the end of that chapter. You can then forget about it. You know you're all clear and it is closure. In England and Wales, 
between 2009 and 2016, there was a 14% fall in police officer numbers and an 18% cut in police budgets. One result of this was an increase in police patrols being single crewed. In Lancashire, we predominantly single crew because um, we need the resources to be able to go all the, to all the incidents and it's a far more effective way of doing that. Where you get problems is where you are generally predominantly single crewing and something unpredictable happens. Those situations are very difficult to factor in without double crewing everybody all the time. And if we were to double crew everybody all the time, we wouldn't have enough police officers to deal with incidents. Studies are trying to establish if being single crewed is responsible for an increase in assaults against the police. There is evidence that if officers are double crewed, that they are more likely to be assaulted. Now, I think the reason behind that is because if you're double crewed, you're going to be sent to the more violent jobs. But what that evidence also shows us, that if you are single crewed, you are, the, the injuries that you sustain are more likely to be far more serious. In Liverpool, Dave Cullen has been a police officer for 20 years and is used to being single crewed. I police a lot of the time on my own um, and quite often you're targeting um, burglars in the night time uh, and drug dealers who may be two, three, four up in a car and there's a greater risk. Any police officer who tells you they're never nervous is lying to you. Um, there's been many times where I've been nervous and worried about my own safety. I was out in my car, just patrolling round. These are the, the car parks um, where I'd previously found stolen cars. And it was just as I was coming to the mouth of the third car park, the van came past quickly typed the registration in and then drove off after the van intended to stop it. The van turned down a side street, the check came back. It was registered outside of the Merseyside area, quite a distance away, and it was insured to someone else in a completely different part of the country, which was strange. And as I've turned, they looked up. Instead of him being just a few car lengths ahead, he was a considerable distance ahead for what, what seemed to me to be trying to get away from me. so I've accelerated to catch up to him. And then the van turned right. As I've turned, I can see the van had just pulled up, approximately where the van is, uh, this van is now, which is separate and nothing to do with it. And a couple of lads had crossed the road and gone into a house and, and a female passenger, and I literally just come to a stop here, just as the, the driver was coming around the front. He seemed all right, didn't seem overly concerned about being stopped, just explained to him just stopping you for a document check. Something to do day in, day out, and without any incidents. So didn't think anything of it at this point. And then went through the, the drug wipe procedure. That normally takes about eight minutes to come back. So I was with him for probably about 10, 10 minutes or so, just me and him in the car. And everything was fine, no issues. And then the drug wipe came back, so put the body cam on. He was thinking he was going to get out, and as I opened the rear door, I then took hold of him, handcuffed him, told him he was under arrest for failing the drug wipe. You are actually under arrest on suspicion of driving whilst over the prescribed limit. Right, so it's got to tell you, mate, that you do not have to say anything, but it may be defence. If you do not mention when questioned, something which you may later learn in court, anything you do say may be given in evidence, OK? The power of arrest is preserved, but it's also for the prompt and effective investigation of the offence. OK, what's happened now, mate? You'll have to come to the police station. He asked me to passed some money to his girlfriend, which was his, but he'd already told me he was unemployed and finding money tight. This pocket here? Yeah. How much is there? Okay. And where's that from? And you're not working it's at the me. moment, that's what he told me. My girlfriend. So that was going to be seized, so I put that back in his pocket. Right. That's coming with you for now. Checked for weapons, nothing else, and he asked me if I could give the keys to his brother. Yeah, I can have this, please. I'm always polite with people, and I will always speak to people uh, in a polite manner um, because I'm very mindful as well, even with people who commit crime, is um, everybody makes mistakes. I'm not going to let 
someone else affect me so badly that it's going to have an impact on my family because I, I try to limit the impact that policing has on my family and when I go home, I'm home. I have a faith and I don't believe that this life's the end of it and so that keeps me going. You're not always going to be okay uh, and you need to be a little bit more switched on uh, with your safety because I want to walk through that door every night back to my family. He's under arrest, drug driving. The brother came, I closed the door of the police car and I started getting the van key off so I could give the house keys to his brother. Does, it does, yeah, that's what I'm taking off now. Doesn't mean he's over the limit, mate. What it means is we have to come to the police station and just do some further tests, that off. Right, Hopefully it shouldn't be too long. And then I suddenly heard a click. The sound of a, a car door being locked from inside. I looked down to my left and the driver had managed to take his seatbelt off and was now climbing in towards the driver's seat. So I immediately reacted, opened the passenger door, sort of dove at him to grab hold of him, at which point I suddenly felt the, the brother grabbing me and I could feel blows to the back of my head. Get him out! Get him out! Con requires! Con requires! Get him out! 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 The main threat was that the brother outside, because he was above me, I managed to reach to me CS spray without looking, sort of just sprayed upwards. Ah! I still had hold of the driver at this time, and the engine of the car was now revving. And this lad just floored it. The passenger door was open. I obviously didn't have my seatbelt on, and I remember thinking, you know, am I going to make it home tonight? I remember pulling at the handbrake as hard as I can, trying to stop. As the car was driving down the road, I said to him, you're gonna, mate, you're going to kill us? And he just went, yeah, I know, yeah. Mate, you're going to kill us? Oh, yeah. It sends a shiver down your spine. Requires, requires. I was fearful of family and what will happen if I don't make it home. Of kids growing up without a dad. <laughs> The car stalled. I was struggling with the lad, so I took my right hand off to transmit on the radio again. Oh. In there's side the urgent assistance. We don't use that phrase, we use con requires. Con requires! But when I did that, the lad managed to run away, at which point then I had to clamber over the driver's seat and, uh, and ran after him on foot. There was a bit of a foot chase. I am reasonably fit for my age, but I was suffering from the effects of CS now as well. Call me quiet. I'd still not heard anything on my radio. Normally when you put out a con requires, you hear all sorts of different call signs shouting up the radio operator trying to find exactly where you are if they can't get you on your radio. And it was nothing, it was just silence. Bale's been arrested, escaped lawful custody, and assaulted me. When the button's pressed, it's a horrible moment in your life. No matter what you're doing, no matter how jovial you, you may be in a moment with someone, when the button gets pressed, your life stops. Got to the bottom of the road, no sign of him. I'm going to go into a house there. So it was basically a big loop he'd done. Got back to the bottom of the road where it had all initially happened. By this time, numerous other officers had, had come and then my own sergeant had turned up. No idea what's gone on. 
and turning up as the sergeant, you know, you're the one who brings order to chaos. And then Dave came out in front of me and he looked pale, he looked shaken up, he was still out of breath. Yeah. I explained to them what had happened, showed them the footage. They were like, right, you need to go back to the police station. Uh, chill out, we'll take over from here. We didn't trace him that night. I uh, didn't trace the other brother that night either. And so I felt that I'd actually I'd done a pretty poor job. Not only had I been assaulted, that I'd allowed someone to drive my vehicle. I felt like a bit of a failure, to be honest. when that the first guy handed himself in. It's a good feeling. It's a positive feeling because you know things are moving on. It was clear in the hours days, weeks following the incident, that it had a profound effect on him. And whilst he came to work, he, he went out, he did his job. It was clear that it, it knocked his confidence. I remember watching the footage again and just having this overwhelming feeling that I wanted to burst out into tears. I'd never experienced feelings like that in 18 years of policing as I was at the time. Are you going to kill us? Oh, yeah. I'd start getting me panic attacks and pains down my arm. So I was starting to have nightmares. I couldn't police properly. I was fearful all the time that it was going to happen again. So I went to my doctors and I ended up being on antidepressants. There's no magical thing that I can say to him as a sergeant which makes his confidence come back, which makes him feel safe to be at work on his own when he's out. All I can do is be supportive. Tango X-ray 99, I'm gonna head that way as well to have a look. Can you give us the last two digits, please? I thought I'm not gonna let him win. I'm not gonna let someone else affect me so badly that I can't do the job that I love. I persevered and eventually came off the antidepressants and I'm back out and about on my own without worrying when I stop cars. Between 2013 and 2018, there was a 25% increase in the number of police officers on long-term sick leave. I think a police officer um, should come into this job with their eyes wide open, knowing that um, from time to time, uh, facing uh, physical uh, conflict is part and parcel of the job. The public expect that of us. I think for officers who are seriously assaulted, it can be a career and life-changing experience. The psychological impact, the impact on somebody's confidence, the impact on somebody's well-being, the impact on their mental health and their families and partners' mental health when they are severely assaulted can take a lot longer and can be something that keeps coming back time and time again. Medical grounds now account for a higher proportion of those leaving the police than it did 10 years ago. When we have officers who have been assaulted, if they're not treated properly, if we don't look after our people, that's when they're saying, I don't want to do this job anymore. In North Wales, Mark Lee has been a PC for 10 years. He currently works in plain clothes. Anglesey is beautiful. It's a lovely place. But the reality is the ruralness of where we are comes with its own issues. We are busy because there aren't that many of us. Policing Anglesey is a luxury, really, because, yeah, crime is low. It's a safe place to live. And um, we tend to know who our criminals are. I've worked with Debbie on and off since 2013. 
but luckily we got on really well. We argue like a married couple. Not that old married couples argue, but we do argue a lot. All we do is bicker, but the bond there is really strong. That red say has been back again. Did you get the red? Of the yeah. Did say it? Yeah. Where's it gone now? Oh, I, go I, don't, I don't know. I don't have X-ray eyes. I thought you said you saw it. I did see it. Where's it gone then? Well, I don't know where it's gone. I was turning around. Did it around. go that way? Or did it go that way? And just get out of the car. <laughs> Both he and I are known for being shit magnets. Is is what we're known as within the police. Um, yeah, if it's going to happen, it will happen in front of us. Being a plain clothes officer, obviously, it has its pros and cons in the sense that we can do things covertly. It just gives us a slight advantage sometimes at catching people. We do have that luxury that we can be out there practically invisible. The only issues with that, that when we do strike on an individual, that sometimes that can cause them to be confused as to who we are. So they can misconstrue that as being seen to being attacked by a member of the public. It was one of those unusually nice days in Anglesey. The sun was shining and Clangavenue was pretty busy. We went out, we are in town. I remember there was a bus here. And it was roughly here I heard the loud music come on. And I looked in my mirror and this is when the car arrived. And it was just backing off and driving at me and backing off and driving at me. Pulled over exactly where we are now. And I said to Debbie, what's this guy's problem? And as I parked up here, they passed me. I could just see his mouth going and obviously he was saying something. And then it stopped like he realised, oh, that's the police. Because I'm dressed as a, exactly the same then as I am now. He moved off and I decided to follow him. I was stayed a distance off him. And at that point, um, all he'd done is play loud music. So it's just a vibe that I got from the car. But then he started to get more ground on us. So I remember Debbie started to do a check on the car because it then darted to the petrol station. I followed him in. I parked some distance away. Although he parked at a petrol pump, he didn't get out. He just sat in his car. While Debbie was still doing her checks, I remember setting off around the back of the car. I drove around to the front of his vehicle. And as I stopped in front of him um, to stop him driving away, I saw him straight away reaching with his left arm trying to get reverse. And got out of my car. I was wearing a police vest. I had my taser, my radio, um, my spray, everything was on show. So I shouted, stop police. And I believe he hit me with a car. Sorry. <clears throat> it's like something from an action movie. Um, because Mark's been struck, got up onto the bonnet and hit the windscreen and then is carried. There was a pause before he drove at Mark. Now, that's all you need to think, what am I going to do here to get away? Because that's what he wanted to do. He wanted to get away. And if that meant taking Mark out, then that's what he was going to do. I remember banging my head on what I now know to be the floor. I felt the sharp pain. It was um, really, really intense and everything went white. Please watch that vehicle, all trying to get me off. This is down the road. My colleague's just been struck by that vehicle. As I came round the pump, I saw Mark lying on the, on the concrete a, a couple of pumps away. 
I remember just looking at him thinking, he'll get up now, he'll get up, because that's what Mark does. But of course he didn't get up. And it was at that point that I knew um, something really serious had happened to him. We have an ambulance to the uh, petrol station, get to go, garage, some activation, please. Mark's on the floor and he's lifeless. He was white, he was deathly white. He didn't talk initially and yeah, I feared the worst at that point. I remember Debbie arriving and she grabbed hold of my head and said, my head's guilty in my neck. He eventually started to speak to me and just said that all he could see was lights, like really white lights, but obviously uh, there weren't any. So I knew I was dealing with somebody with probable head trauma, concussion. Incident at Glenhover Road, 2872, struck by suspect vehicle, uh, helimed and paramedics in attendance. Initially, I didn't know whether there was anything major that had happened to his head or back or, you know, I, I'm dealing with something I don't know, but the main thing at this moment in time is he's now speaking to me, so he's alive. That's the biggie. Surrounding areas, all officers and the scene surrounding areas. Stations are requested for a Volkswagen Golf in black. If seen, please stop checking and report back to the office. The vehicle has been involved in a RTC and failed to stop after striking a police officer. The officers were dispatched and the little team that we have had then picked up the vehicle. Can we have no officers possibly come to the bridge as far as please? The vehicle was effectively stopped and the offender was arrested uh, pretty swiftly. I couldn't hear anything, I couldn't see anything and I just couldn't open my eyes. and they popped me uh, into an ambulance. And uh, if I went to hospital, I damaged my shoulder quite badly. And I had a scan, and they gave me the good news that there wasn't anything um, sinister. They said, yeah, you have got really, really bad concussion, and it's probably gonna sit with you for about three weeks, if not more. But at least I knew that I was okay. On a regular basis, I get patients in here that have been rammed or they've been thrown onto a bonnet or they've been dragged along by a car door. They've held onto the wing mirror while someone's tried to move off at the same time. Keep going. Yeah, just keep moving slowly. He's very lucky that he's not broken any bones. Breathe out as you slowly roll forwards, nice and steady. So nice and tall. What happens when you do that? There's a trauma there. He's, he's had to put up with somebody trying to run him over. I don't think that's easy for anybody, is it, really? He's got to get his head back round into normal life and, and some of the fears that that drives as well. So it's not just the physical, is it? It's, it's the other side of things as well. Basically, what I'm hoping to achieve is better mobility, less pain. I've been office-bound, which isn't me, and I struggle with. So I'm hoping to uh, finish the next couple of weeks um, on a high and be able to go back out policing on the street where I should be, really. You know, if, if somebody tries to run you over, yeah, that's going to make a big impression on you, isn't it? If someone points a gun at your head, you know, how's that going to drive you for the rest of your life? Do you ever get that out of your head? I doubt it. But you learn to manage it better. Um, and these people are pretty strong characters. The part that bothers me the most is definitely the, the why. I understand people have a dislike for the police, and I know that people will do pretty much anything to get away from the police um, if they feel threatened. But I never expected someone to run me over. We've had this as plainclothes officers over and over again. 
Their defence will be, you were in plain clothes, I didn't know you were the police. That day, Mark's equipment was, was visible and there is no reason or plausible excuse on this earth that that guy can give me uh, for running Mark over that day. Why didn't he stop afterwards? His windscreen was completely shattered. He couldn't see where he was going. He didn't stop. He didn't get out to ask if I was OK, because he didn't care. And it's not OK to just run over the police who were doing their job. Our role is to protect the public, but it would be nice if we felt protected ourselves.